Hey guys, I am here with actor and activist and author and environmentalist. Do you have one more for me before I say your name? That's a puppeteer. Puppeteer. No, Ed Bagley Jr. I did not know the puppeteer. I'm not a puppeteer. Portion. I just wanted to embellish my resume. That was that was pretty good. It's a thing to do nowadays. Just pad it a little bit. Uh, you guys, of course, uh, know Ed from a zillion uh, movies and TV shows. Uh, but what your real passions are, I think your real passions are really the environment, right? Even more than right. acting, although you've done a tremendous amount of I great stuff. I have a great deal of passion for acting, but uh, the urgency is such that uh, I have a lot of zeal for environmental work now, now more than ever. I started in 1970, but now more than ever. Well, so much of the stuff that you've dedicated your life to is so in line with what we do here at Riot, which is why I've been harassing you on Twitter for about two Happily. years to get in here. About and, time. And you came in. So what I want to start with is environmental stuff is now cool, but you were doing this stuff. 30 years ago, if not longer. 45 Four, years ago. Or 45 years ago, so start there. How did you get into it and what possessed you to be doing this when it wasn't cool? Because everybody's doing it now, right? It was very uncool to drive a three-wheel electric vehicle back in 1970, I can promise you. It was not a babe was, magnet. Yeah. I took Cindy Williams on a date, a woman who played Shirley in yeah, the show with Vernon Shirley. I took course. her on a date in my electric vehicle. I'll pick you up in my electric car. At first, I thought it was kind of cool, but I don't think I'd fully charged it or something. Right. It was going kind of slow. There was a kid going past us on Hot Wheels giving <laughs> us a finger. No, it was Wait, slow. but how did you actually get an electric car back then? So you built this yourself? Or no, not? I bought it from a guy named Dutch, and I just looked up in the yellow pages and went, I'm going to just, so I can tell people I tried, I'm going to look up under electric cars or electric vehicles to see that they don't have them. I know nobody, what the hell is this? Electric cars. The guy wow. sold them. They were really... Uh, they were really supposed to be for like retirement communities. They had a California license plate, mm -hmm. but it was basically a golf cart with an enclosure, you know, like a and Kansas it was fully store. it was fully legal. I mean, you, it was it street was... legal. I quickly surmised it was much cheaper to plug it in the wall than it was to buy 1970 gasoline. Same way my electric car, my Nissan Leaf, is the same today. It's cheaper to plug it, that into the wall yeah. than to buy 2015 gasoline. Just cheaper. So I like that, and there was no maintenance to, to speak of, no tune-up or oil change or fan belt, radiator flush, smog check, valve job, none of that anymore. So I went, I like this green stuff. But what really led me to it before that electric car was living in smoggy L.A. My dad was a very positive person, and he was a, a conservator who liked to conserve. He turned off the lights and turned off the water, saved string and saved tin foil. So he was the son of Irish immigrants. He had lived through the Great Depression. So he died within a few days of the first Earth Day, David. And so I did a lot of this stuff to honor him as much as anything. Yeah. So when you started doing this, did people think you were nuts? Because right even now, I'll see some weird vehicle on the road you yeah. know, that somebody's makeshift put together. I'm not talking about the Leaf or the Volt. Right. Some other thing. And it'd be like, well, what's that person what's up that? to? So they must have thought you were bonkers. I, the electric car was nutty, but all the other stuff, people right away went, that's good, I want to do that. Recycling in 1970 yeah. was quite cumbersome. You had to drive it to my electric car, thankfully. I would drive it to, you know, like Sun Valley. Only on Saturdays and Sundays between 12 and 3 could you recycle anything. Mm -hmm. Glass, aluminum, anything. A newspaper. So I took all that stuff there starting in 1970. I started composting. And composting back then, I was in an apartment, so I couldn't have a compost pile. I had like a little you know, a diaper pail with a lid on it, you know, and I put all the table scraps in that and I would take it. What am I going to do with it? I saved it. Now, I didn't think it through. What do I do with it now? Yeah. I'm in an apartment. I, the, near the railroad tracks, there's some land there. Nobody will probably bother me. And I started going in the dead of night. And I'd dig a hole and put this stuff just to return it to the sure. earth to kind of, you know, do, and suddenly stuff was growing there where I was burying this stuff and it was kind of a great lesson because stuff just started growing from just burying organic matter in the ground. Incredible. And, and we still don't really do that that much, right? We should have no. way more composting programs. So just as an easy thing, we're going to get more to that kind of stuff later. Yeah, anybody has any piece of property with a front or backyard, grow some food, you know, growing lawns is kind of some rich feudal lord leftover or something, but you should grow some food that you can eat. And then also don't be trucking in organic matter to amend the plants with, you know, plant food, make your own plant food from your old table scraps and grass clippings or whatever you got. As far as the drought, that seems to be what everybody's talking about right now. Huge now, issue. ironically, I don't know if people can see, but you have a couple of drips on you because it is actually... Oh my God, yes. I, it is, it's not sweat, it's not flop sweat, but it's raining and people are God. actually excited and we are in the midst of well tell us a little bit about the drought because we've done some stories on it it's bad i mean it's really it's a bad. very bad drought there's been very few years in the long history of measuring water measuring water in la it's been worse than this we had a year that was three and a half inches of uh, about 
1920 something, I think. I look back at the history of LA rainfall. This past year has been seven and a half inches before what we just got today. Mm -hmm. When I hear the news tonight, we'll know what it is, maybe seven, three quarter or eight inches. That's a very bad year. Yeah. Average, normal is 15 or 16 inches. So we have to do something. We've been wasting water by washing our cars out in the driveway. We're all guilty of it, yeah. everybody. Growing these lush lawns or what have you in a Mediterranean ecosystem you know, a semi-arid grassland is what this is technically, and it is very dry here. And the only reason LA has survived and had all these lawns and all these, this prosperity is because we got our straw dipped in somebody else's drink. A lot of the people along the Colorado River, like maybe, oh, let's say Colorado, would like to, you know, hold on to some of that water. Mm -hmm. And in Arizona and what have you, everybody wants a piece of it. And then the other one is the California aqueduct that takes water from the San Joaquin Delta. So those three legs to the stool are the only thing that keeps us from falling over. And if one of them gets a little wobbly, we're going to have real trouble. Do you think people actually understand the severity of this? No. Because I just read a story this week that Ethos, which is the company that Starbucks gets right. their yes. bottled water from, they're moving out of California Good. now because there's not enough water here. Good for them. What do we have to do to actually get people to wake up? Because, you know, it's one of those things where it's like it happens so slowly that people don't really realize, or they think, well, my lawn's all right, I'll still keep going with my right. lawn. What, what do you do to kind of really slap people in the face with this? I don't know that you can do any more than every water agency, every news broadcast, practically everybody, every newspaper is doing. The illusion is this right here. Hey, I want some water, here we go. Mm. It's available, you turn on the tap and it comes out, so we think it's all going to last forever. Yeah. But we're near the end, we're heading towards a cliff now, because what has recharged the aquifers, that they're going deeper and deeper with water bottling plants and agriculture, the, the, the solution to the problem is just go deeper and deeper. Mm -hmm. That's our bank account. You're draining your bank account to nothing. You get a paycheck at some point to replenish that bank account. There's no payday now, because there's, right. there's no Sierra snowpack. That's what we're up against, and people, I'm afraid, I kept, if we'd had this conversation a month ago, no, we're going to get to them. We're going to let them know somehow. And maybe we are, but I don't know what it's going to take. You can't let people know anymore. There's people in my neighborhood that still have these lush lawns, the sprinklers are on in the rain. Mm -hmm. In the rain, you come and you see the sprinklers on, which now is a violation, and yeah. it should be. So I've been seeing these stories pop up on Gawker and some of these sites where they're, now they're trying to publicly shame some of these people. You know, they listed a bunch of celebrities with big lush lawns. But isn't that just a tiny portion of it? Isn't this real, like the real usage is really from probably industrial stuff, right? And, and golf courses and things like that. Like yeah. the residential stuff, even though I guess it gets headlines, isn't that Everybody's got to right? come to the party. Residential yeah. is part of it, but you're right, it's much smaller. The notion of growing rice and almonds on the western side of the San Joaquin Valley is just, uh, I think it's just foolhardy. We had the illusion that it was going to be okay for years because we had excess. All these people that say, I've got a ticket in line for my water. It's the law. You can't take it from me. I'm an almond grower. I grow mm -hmm. rice. I grow broccoli. I grow whatever. The people who grow broccoli and lettuce can go, well, okay, I'm not getting my allotment the way I used to. I'll leave it fallow for a year and get a state or federal tax credit for doing the good thing. But what do you do with an almond tree? You can't leave it fallow. These people have their ticket in line. All of these tickets in line for water in California are based on excess, nearly all of them. Yeah. There's very few that aren't based on excess from the San Joaquin Delta. There's been no excess for years. It's this illusion that people in residential neighborhoods, people in agriculture, everybody thinks because they, they somehow turn on a, a tap and it comes and out, it magically comes and they out. point the finger at you know they point the finger at environmentalists mm -hmm. for doing like causing this, like we're the ones doing it. That's like blaming the smoke detector company for the fire. <laughs> you know we didn't start this fire. We're just trying to save whatever species we can. The San Joaquin, you know, in the San Francisco Bay Delta, certain species of fish are like canaries in the coal mine. That's for all of us. You can't dry up all the water. You can't suck it dry and go. How did that happen? Mm -hmm. You know, we know we can see it coming. What's the silver lining here? Is it that technology is going to save us? Is it going to be we're going to start rebuilding desalinization plants? Is it that? Is it that the conservation will work? Or have we crossed that threshold where even if we cut back, we're still behind the eight ball? What's the silver the lining ball. here? Uh, desal should be the last thing on your list. That's when you're really, people are, you know, standing in line like, you know, Blade Runner kind of <laughs> life. You know, people are in real trouble, dying of thirst and what have you. Uh, so is it not efficient? That's what people say, right? It takes a lot of it energy. It takes a tremendous amount of energy. The, and yeah. you have people go, well, all you got left is table salt. It's salt. It's not quite table salt. Where do you put it? You can't really easily in reintroduce it in the marine environment without 
hurting a lot of species, you know, because it's such a concentration of salt and other minerals. Yeah. So there's a problem with that, and there's a lot of energy, but there's much cheaper ways. Let's just follow the money and the economy of it. If we collected our rainwater, really collected efficiently in two important ways, people doing it the way I did it for years, poor man's rainwater capture, saw off with the hacksaw, your downspout, put a barrel under it, put it up on some blocks, so you can get to the spigot at the bottom, and you're gonna collect your rainwater for like 80 bucks a barrel or whatever yeah. they charge for them now. You can get them online. Mm -hmm. I think they're 80 bucks for a barrel or something like that. There are discount ones where people recycle old olive oil barrels sure. or something. You yeah. can get those even cheaper. So do that, number one. Number two, people have more resources, which I do. I'm building a lead platinum home. I put a 10,000 gallon rainwater tank underground, 10,000 yeah. gallons. That will surely take care of all my irrigation needs from the last rain in May to the first rain in October. That's the other one. And the most important one, to break up a lot of the way we've concretized you know, we've paved over places like LA, more permeable surfaces so the water can go down to the water table. Well, that's exactly where I wanted to end the conversation about the drought because that is exactly what we do here. We try to let you guys know that you can do something with the news. So not only the government's doing things, but there's things that you yourself can do. Anyway, what do you think? Is the, is the drought as bad as it seems? Are you doing anything? Let us know in the comments right down below. So one of the things we talk about on my show all the time is our food sources here in America you know, all the subsidies, corn, all that stuff. I was watching an interview that you did, and you were talking about just a plant-based diet and how it can affect our bodies and our minds and the economy and all this stuff. So I thought it was an interesting uh, place to jump off with you on this, is how important is food in general to the environment? Just the stuff that we take in, how important is that to the bigger environmental picture? There's a friend of mine, he was a cattle rancher, feedlot operator, and he says that the fork is one of the most dangerous weapons we've ever held in our hand. And I think there's some truth to that. Again, I don't want to dictate to anybody what they eat. My mm -hmm. wife eats meat, and I don't really give her a hard time about it. She eats it rarely, but she does on occasion. Yeah. She eats a fair amount of chicken and fish and what have you, things like that. I'm a vegan myself because I, I think it's good for me. I really feel very good when I eat a plant-based diet, mm -hmm. and it's certainly good for the ecosystem. It just takes so much more water mm -hmm. and land and energy to grow a pound of beef than it does a pound of broccoli. Yeah. So that's something we have to consider, even for the meat eaters to eat, as I suppose my wife does, you know, just a few times a year or a few times a month if you're a big meat eater. Mm -hmm. Just cut down a bit and see if you can live with that and see how you like it. And there's other substitutes now. You know, in the old days, that was what we had to do to survive. It's a different world now. You can be up in Fairbanks or Juneau, you can get veggie dogs and broccoli in the middle of winter. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a different world that we live in. Yeah. And so uh, I think a plant-based diet is a very good way to go. And certainly when you're growing it yourself, it's quite economical. You can make very cheap vegetables if you do it that way. If not, if you're buying lots of, you know, plant amendments that are expensive and water, tap water with, coming from a meter, you know, you can wind up with $8 tomatoes if you're yeah, not careful. For sure. So, how, how much of it is that we're just hugely separated from our food sources? You know, they do all these studies yes. where it's something like the average uh, chicken that you might get at Trader Joe's came from 2,000 miles away, or something crazy where only 100 years ago you pretty much lived in a village or pretty much close by where you were getting your food from. It comes uh, such great distances now. People just want their damn grapes in the middle of winter. They come from Chile, of course. You know, they want different things. You can do that, but it's, it comes at great cost. I try to eat seasonally as best I can. You know, nobody's perfect, but I go to the farmer's market there in Studio City yeah. to supplement what I can't grow myself. But I've been growing food since I've had my very first home in 1979. Before that, I was apartment renter. You know, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't grow food. Back then, they didn't have community gardens the way they do now. Mm -hmm. Now, if, you don't have, if you're in an apartment, you don't have a piece of dirt in your front or backyard, you can get part of a community garden. If they don't have one, you can start one. Yeah. There's a lot of that available. But I've shown my kids, who are now 36 and 37, who both are master gardeners, I've shown them where food comes from. It doesn't come from the Ralph's tree or the Safeway bush. It comes from soil and water and sunshine, and that's how you make food. What do you think about the, the other part of it? Not just the stuff that you're putting in your system to stay alive, but sort of the therapeutic part of it. Because I have, I have an apartment, but I have a little, little front area where I grow some Fantastic. tomatoes and some mint and you know, a bunch of herbs and things like that. And I find just clipping the stuff, I actually find it calms me down. It gets me away from my phone and all the electronics. And I feel like that's an important piece of it too, just for your mental state as a human. You know, you're reconnecting into, to that. You're into the big one now. I know I've, 
myself have one of these smart devices. I'm looking at, hey man, there's a we, great website for Yosemite. We gotta look at this website for Yellowstone. <laughs> Put the thing away, put it in your pocket, turn it off, get to Yosemite, get yeah. to Yellowstone. If not, if you're not inclined to do that, you don't have time, just get out to your garden. And you don't have a garden, get part of a community garden. As you're suggesting, if you get your hands in the dirt, it's the ultimate therapy. You feel connected again yeah. to what our real riches are. I think I get my paycheck from Sony Pictures or from Warner Brothers or Universal Studios. That's not where I get my real paycheck from. That's where I buy a bunch of stuff stuff like Home Shopping Network stuff, and some stuff perhaps a little more important than that. But mostly, mostly I'm buying stuff with the money that I make at my supposed job. My real income, I think, is from the soil and the water and the sunshine to grow food and be part of that system. That's what we really need, clean water, clean air, and food. And that's our, our real wealth. That's our real paycheck. I yeah. Think. Now, you're not telling Sony that it would be okay to pay you in composting, right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it was a nice sentiment. I, may, I, yeah, I think I may have misspoken. You may yes, have misspoken. I, I might bit. have misspoken that. So one of the most interesting things I think about this is how businesses are finally coming around. So you were on the front end of doing this personally, and I see a lot of people doing that now, but actually businesses are becoming green and they're becoming aware that people want this. Are there, how do you, when you're shopping, and you know, not just for food, but for whatever, how do you sort of mitigate figuring out what's doing good work, what companies are being uh, responsible, and all that. Well, you guys are deep into that, into rewarding good companies and good behavior, and I think that's great, uh, Riot, that they're doing that. And it's something I've been interested in for years. A lot of businesses have figured out what we started to see at the late 80s, early 90s. There was a company called Northern Telecom, Nortel, uh, Northern Telecom. They made more than half the switching equipment back then for AT&T. And part of their process to clean their circuit boards, they use CFCs. But the head of the company back then, in 1989, whatever, started to hear about ozone depletion. He went, from the top on down, all my middle management people, all the top executives like me, down the janitor, we're going to find some way to stop using CFCs, and we're going to do that because it's the right thing to, to do. I don't care what it costs. I'll take a haircut with my salary. Yeah. And he said it and he meant it. They found there was a way to do with citrus, to clean the circuit boards with citrus or something or some other substance, and they, the circuit boards worked just fine. They didn't have a diminished product because of it. And he met with the CFO after a year or so of doing it. He said, tell me the bad news now that I've mouthed off and done this. How much does this cost us? We saved $250,000. Yeah. So that was a kind of a wake-up call, late 80s, early 90s. People right. went, wait a minute, they did the right thing and they saved money? There's lots of that out there. Occasionally, people are doing it and it costs them. That happens on occasion. Sometimes it's revenue neutral, but the vast majority of the time that I've seen that people did the right thing, certainly with new buildings, when businesses are moving into remodeling or building a new build building, they realize the savings nowadays because building a new building or even a house, as mm -hmm. I'm doing a lead platinum home, it's like an iceberg. The kind of iceberg where there's a little tiny piece above the water, just a little triangle above the water. The vast amount of that iceberg is below the water. That's the cost of running the building mm -hmm. over time, over its many, many years of use. That little piece at the top is the cost of building it. That's a little chunk. It looks massive at the time. Right. When you're standing on it there, you know, waiting for rescue, it looks really big, that mm -hmm. number that it costs to do a remodel or to build from the ground up. But over the life of it, it's, it's a huge number, and people who are in it for the long haul, and many businesses are looking long-term. They used to just look at the, the quarterly dividend. Look, what's a quarterly number? I don't want to get fired. I don't want the board to get on my ass. What can I do to show a good quarterly return? They're looking beyond that and telling the board, we got to be good corporate citizens and for the long-term health of this company, because guess what? I'm having a psychic moment now. Energy prices are going to go up. You know? and <laughs> they're still going to go up. They're huh? still going to go up. Yeah. Just buying some energy-efficient lighting and an energy-saving thermostat for your mom and pop store and some weather stripping and little stuff, you're going to get a payback on that stuff right away. So I know a lot of people will say, and I think you're addressing this already, but a lot of people say, well, it's easy. It's easy for you, Ed. You've got more money. You can do it. Correct. You know, blah, blah, blah. But you're saying there are ways to do this, and haven't they shown that when companies do some of these changes, people are willing to pay a little bit more, that that social responsibility has become part of all these business plans, right? Many people are with many companies. You have to do this stuff because of, uh, you know, it's, it's the right thing to do, I, I, I really think, and the return is there. People are going to feel good about it over time. People are going to understand and, and when people say to me, the most important point I want to make is when people say to me, Ed, I can't afford a Nissan Leaf like you have today. Mm -hmm. I can't afford, you know, uh, solar panels like you have a six kilowatt system. And I say, neither could I when I started. When I started in 1970, 
it was very expensive to buy solar panels. So I didn't do that. It took me 20 years to buy solar electric, two decades. But I did the cheap and easy stuff and I saved money. The electric car I bought in 1970 was not expensive like a Nissan Leaf or a Tesla. I couldn't afford a Tesla today, <laughs> but I could afford a Leaf. But Tesla's pretty cool though. I was it's a very one. cool it's, it's car. Pretty cool, yeah. If I get another series or something, I'm <laughs> buying one. But people who say they can't do it the way I do it, agreed. I couldn't either when I started. You don't run up Mount Everest. You get to base camp and you get acclimated and adjust and you see how high you can climb. Some people aren't going to make it to the summit. Some people are never going to be able to afford solar electric. But can you buy some light bulbs to lower your energy bill? Put money in your pocket right away. Mm -hmm. You know, energy saving thermostat, weather stripping, bike riding when weather and fitness permit, public transportation if it's, it's avail available near you, home gardening, home composting. All that stuff is dirt cheap. Do that stuff and you're going to see money back right away. All right, so naturally, I have to talk about climate change with you. You're a big denier, am I mistaken? <laughs> Maybe I'll switch over that. Maybe yeah. there's a big payday in that. I can really cash out. <laughs> yeah, let's get some headlines here. Yeah. All right, so climate change. I can't believe that in 2015, still, when you watch cable news and whenever they're talking about climate change, they still bring on two people to debate it as if it's in a, a debate. You know what I mean? It's not a debate. The scientific community, give me a percentage here. What is it? Something like 91% of scientists? It's 97% is the number that I've heard. Okay, so 97%. Uh, I'm not a mathematician, but that's a pretty high percentage. Yet they still have these people debating. What, what do you think's going on there? For, we'll talk about the media part in a sec, but just in terms of how people can deny something that science is consistently proving. There's a the lack theory? of understanding. There's people just dug in. There's several lawmakers, I think, don't believe it anymore, who still say that they're deniers, but they're really not. But we just don't know how to break them out of jail together. You yeah. can't break them out one at a time. They'll be shot by the, the prison guards. So, like, but they're, they're almost held out, hostage by their constituents. They're held that hostage tricked, by their, and their beliefs that they're dug yeah. in. They don't know how to... It needs to be a jailbreak where you break all seven or nine of them out together somehow. Yeah. We've got to figure out how to get them all out so they can... Just, you know, there'd be safety in numbers if you could do that. Yeah. I don't think they all believe it. And they can't, you can't believe it anymore. There's just enough uh, very good uh, science, scientific clues as to the fact it's not only happening, but man is the number one culprit. Yeah. If you add more CO2 to the atmosphere, it warms up the planet. It's always done that. And we have much more CO2 than we've ever had. So to, den to deny that that's happening and have all this stuff about it's, you know, what's happening on Mars and all this stuff, it's all background noise. Yeah. It's really good science. People say, well, Galileo was a rogue and he had a different theory and he was persecuted. You're persecuting us. No, Galileo had science. He saw, he got a telescope, primitive by today's standards, but looked over the, holy Christ, there's Ganymede and Io and Callisto and Europa, and they're going around <laughs> Jupiter. I can see it. They're in different positions. They're right. clearly moving around Jupiter. Right. I can see it. Copernicus and Galileo use science, and so to, to use that, we, we embrace this denial at our own peril. Yeah. And right now, whatever we do now, it is my opinion that there will be great damage done to like the Marshall Islands in South Florida, what have you. That's in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. The time to stop that was back in the 90s. Yeah. If we had taken the action that was recommended and pleaded for and begged for, the, perhaps we could have done something with that. But now we're 2015, people are still debating it and they're not willing. There's a lot of money obviously in fossil fuels still. And the people who have interest in fossil fuels want to squeeze the last dollar out. And people, kid themselves. I don't think everybody goes, I don't care that I'm ruining the planet. I'm going to do this. And I don't think a lot of people even think that. I, I think they think, I've heard some sci people are in denial, like the alcoholic in denial. Yeah. They think, no, I I'm not doing anything with to make climate change. They're wrong about that. And I need to keep people warm and healthy and what have you and transport goods and services around. I'm doing a good thing. And people lie to themselves about stuff. It's like an alcoholic. We're all alcoholics on oil. We yeah. really are. <laughs> yeah. And so the alcoholic goes, it's that damn boss of mine that caused me that problem. He was such a bastard. That's why I got fired. And that bitch of a wife, mm -hmm. the reason I got a divorce is because, and that cop, that was a crazy, badge heavy cop. To, it was a cop. It was the wife. It was the boss. It's never yourself. And we're the addicts like that. Right. We, we want to deny that it's, that it's fossil fuels that's doing this because it's such a wonderful thing. I ride my bike up Laurel Canyon to Mulholland regularly. And it takes a lot of work, David. Yeah. But if you can just do this 
and get to the top of Mulholland. That's all the effort I did, yeah. just this. Yeah. Not pedaling up for 20 minutes up the top of Mulholland. Just went like that, and I get up to the top of Mulholland. It's like, what a miracle. <laughs> and to plow your fields, you used to get the oxen. You had to uh -huh. get animals to help you with the work and get an ox, a team of oxen and go through the fields and hang on to the thing yourself. It was like this, and it was a lot of work to, to till a field by hand is tremendous work. Suddenly they got these contraptions that will till it for you, mm -hmm. a machine. This goes to what we were talking about before, about how far we are from our food and how easily we can get everything and the phones that we're, it's all sort of interlaced and sort of takes the responsibility away from us in so many ways. Yeah, it's a free lunch that we thought would go on forever and never had a price tag. You know, nobody ever thought there would be something like climate change. There was a brief, a, a very brief theory from the scientific community in the 60s about global cooling. Yeah. It didn't get much play because it didn't really make any sense, you know, but it lasted about a year or two. All it made was a cover of Popular Science magazine. Mm -hmm. It didn't really make peer-reviewed studies like it has, like uh, global warming has, but it lasted a while. People have been in denial about it a long time. And then when James Hansen started to testify at the guy from NASA in the 80s, a lot of the scientific community, indeed people who were, had embraced the global cooling thing briefly, uh, they were like, wait a minute, this makes more sense. Let me look at the numbers. And they looked at the numbers, and one by one they were convinced. There's very few people left who think it's not happening, scientists who think it's not happening. Consider it in the medical community, though, David. You go to a doctor, and he says, Ed, you got a problem. You have cancer. You've got to get chemo or radiation or something right away. Thank you. Go to another doctor. Ed, you have cancer. You, have, you need chemo or radiation or something, some treatment like that right away. I'm going to go, the, the last three doctors tell you you're fine. You're going to go with the last three? You're going to go with the 97 who told you of that you're, you need cancer treatment. Right, and you can't say, well, I don't believe in cancer, thus it doesn't exist. You can say is, it well, you can at say your own it. peril. <laughs> right, you can say it at your own peril. And that's where we're at now. So what would you say to all the people, because this is one of the things I hear a lot from Republicans, they'll say, well, America, what, what we put out there now, it's unfair for us to say it to other countries because we've been through our industrial revolution already. Right. So we can't tell India to, what to do right now or a lot of you know, places in that part of the world. We can't tell them they have to do it because they're going through what we did. You know what I mean? Like, so that there's a sort of uh, self-importance yeah. here. We have to help those other countries leapfrog over that old technology. We built our Brooklyn Bridge and Empire State Building with high sulfur coal and steel mills you know, in Pittsburgh polluting the air. That's what we did. We yeah. did that. Now, you don't have to do that again. I remember kind of waking up to the idea of leapfrogging over old technology. Back in the 90s, I went to Australia, and in Australia in the 90s, everybody had a cell phone. Homeless people had cell phones. <laughs> it was somehow very cheap there with the way they put up the repeaters and everything quickly, or they had mm -hmm. subsidies for them. I don't know what. They had it because they leapfrogged over the whole thing. There's, there's such a vast country, and they certainly had phone lines in yeah. Australia, but the idea of stringing new lines everywhere and getting telephone lines all throughout the outback and every part of Australia, no. Cell repeaters, they leapfrogged over the old te technology. Yeah. We have to help them do that with solar. The people in these poor villages, they need light in their hut right now because they're knocking over kerosene lamps and getting burned and they're carrying kerosene great distances, carrying you know, uh, firewood, taking down the last tree, uh, you know, carrying firewood great distances. We can help them with solar panels and solar ovens. You leapfrog over the old technology. Yeah. And now that doesn't work for everything in places like China who want to manufacture all sorts of goods and what have you. You have to do other things, but they're realizing the problem now in Beijing because of the, la the lost productivity from the air pollution there. Yeah, we've they, done stories on that town. I forget the name of the town with the smog. So that polluted. Yeah, it's just beyond imagination. And they're starting to see the unfortunate side effect of it. It's not just that people were unhappy, they're losing productivity. Why didn't you show up for work again today? I was in the hospital, I was in the pulmonary clinic. Yeah. I couldn't breathe, I have emphysema, I have cancer, I'm dying of cancer from the pollution. That's why I missed work, I'm very sorry. Yeah, so maybe that's what'll get them because they do love productivity. So eventually if the productivity really starts going down, maybe that then causes some uh, they're put, change. They're putting up plenty of coal plants, I'm not suggesting they aren't, but they're putting up many, many more solar manufacturing plants than we are. Yeah. They're really, doubling down on, uh, on solar as well, and wind, and we need to export a lot of our good American technology for them in a number of ways, clean air issues and, and others. I think they can benefit from what we've learned. Hey, a little bit of good news today, folks. You hear yeah. a lot of bad news. Here's some good news. 
From 1970 to date, when I started this, we have four times the cars in LA, millions more people. Now here comes the good news. We have a fraction of the smog. Yeah, because we did it. We did that. You and I and everybody yeah. here in LA did that, David, because of catalytic converters on cars, combined cycle gas turbines, spray paint booths, all the things big and small, cleaning up the ports of uh, San Pedro and Long Beach, you know, plugging those boats in instead of having them running in the harbor. All that stuff, big and small, that we did all worked. So we need to export that great technology to China and India and have them use it and to clean up the air in these cities and have them uh, be better world stewards you know, for climate change. So I was watching your web series on Bagley Street and you are building a house from ground up. This, this is clearly your dream, right? Like this, this project, is this the dream project more than anything else you've ever done? Is this no. it? No? This has been something kicking and screaming my wife dragged me to. I lived in this house for 26 years. The house was on a show called Living With Ed. Yep. I've been there since 88. I loved it. I used to joke, but I wasn't entirely joking that I would be composted out back. Yeah. You know, and then she kept saying from early on when we were dating in the 90s, she'd go, hey, you need more closet space. I don't have any room. <laughs> whoa, whoa, honey. Okay, okay. I hear you. you got to find another guy. you got to start dating because yeah. this is not going to work. I, I'm, I'm never going to move from this house ever. Read my lips, I'm never moving. Yeah. And so I said that and I meant it. 93, 94, 95, finally, by 2010, she had worn me down. We had had three very successful years with that show, Living With Ed, and an mm -hmm. acting career was doing good and green product endorsements. So we had the money to do it. She said, we've got the money now, please, would you consider, if I could get you more solar, rooftop space to get more exposure for your panels. If I could get you a bigger vegetable garden, I could get you more room for a rainwater tank underground. Would you move then? I said, okay, if you can At find point, yeah. A, B, C, D, E, F, G for this price for F, um, yeah, then I'll move. Yeah. And uh, the bitch did it. <laughs> she found a place and I had a, you know. That's your quote, not mine. I know. Yeah. It's gonna be good when we're moved into this house and happy about it. I'll feel very good about it all because you can only do so much with a retrofit. I was right. starting with, in 88 when I bought that home, it was a 1936 energy inefficient house. There was no insulation in the walls whatsoever. I blew it in. Mm -hmm. No insulation in the attic. Put these big recycled denim you know, bats up there. Did all this stuff, one thing after another. I made it as efficient as you could. Let me tell you what you can do with new construction. We can blow incredible insulation in the walls. It's modern foam insulation. The walls are 12 inches thick. It's passive solar design. So wintertime, the sun is hitting the glass. Summertime, and a little before, a little after, no sun is hitting the glass. Uh, incredible Lutron smart equipment for the lighting control, shades and lighting fixtures. Uh, incredible high sear rating heating and air units, variable flow, four different zones. It's amazing what you can do with modern construction, and we're doing it all. Yeah. Kohler, low water use, uh, faucets and fixtures, everything that you can do, we're doing it. What would you say to the people, and I hear well-known authors say this often, that we've, at some point within the next hundred years, we're gonna have to leave this little planet, this little rock that we're on that has some green and happens to have the right cosmic mix of stuff for life here, that we're gonna actually have to go, and that's sort of the point of humanity that we'll use it up here and then we'll move on. You can see I watch a lot of sci-fi too. Yeah. So, uh, what, what would you say about that? There's no place that we can get to and there's a lot of risk in space of radiation and other things as they'll see when they send a man to Mars, which you're probably gonna do soon. Yeah. You'll see the effects of just getting 57 million miles, which is nothing yeah. compared to, and Mars, the idea of setting up a station there, what would you do on Mars? How would you grow food there? The kind of biosphere. Remember that thing, biosphere of in course, the 90s? Of course. You know, the idea they were not even remotely self-sufficient. They had a big natural gas generator there to generate a fair amount of the power. Yeah. And even then, people got sick and there was all kinds of problems. With I think the they found out that someone was coming and going from the thing. Somebody was coming yeah, and going yeah. and there was like some sort of mold or fungus that got in there in that closed ecosystem. Yeah. It's very hard. The idea of having a spare planet somewhere is folly. I don't think, we, I don't think that's going to so happen. So you think this is, this this is, is it. it? This yeah. is as good as it gets for life as we know it. We need to make this as hospitable. It has always been a hospitable planet for us in our history. Before we were born, millions of years ago, it was volcanic and very uh, inhospitable, but it's been, a, it's been in a sweet spot for a while, and we have to keep it there with our behavior as best we can. On that note, do you have any last-minute tips? I, I think you've given us some good stuff here. 
But for the average person that doesn't even care about this stuff, what are like the two most simple things that you could tell someone, all right, go ahead and try to incorporate some of this? At the root of it, just live simply so others can simply live. Try to keep your life as simple as possible. Having said that, a tip, a new tip that I like to tell people is about something called vampire power. Unplug all that stuff that you don't need when you go to sleep or leave the house. There's a lot of things that you think you need on all the time but that mm -hmm. you don't. In fact, it's a short list of things that you need on, like your clock radio, your, you know, whatever things like that that are going to be blinking midnight when you mm -hmm. come back. You plug those in into a power strip and leave them alone. On the other power strips, you put all those little transformers, little plugs and things, put them in there, and one, two, three perhaps is all it'll be around your house. Turn off those power strips at night when you leave the house. You'll save a tremendous amount of money. All right, well, Ed Bagley, it has been a pleasure. I'm glad we finally got to do this in person. This is better than 140 characters, right? You're pretty good. No question. I but, like it a lot better. You're very good, David. This is a lot better. I appreciate that. And you guys can check out Ed's show on Bagley Street. It is on YouTube. We're going to annotate to it right around here. It's here somewhere. And, of course, on Twitter. Anything else we should pimp out? No, that's plenty. How about Earth? Earth in general. Earth in general. Protect your Earth. Protect your Earth. There you go.